Hello, my name is Justin Coop. At last check, I was age 35. Uh, today is October 2nd, 2015. I am here in Sacramento, California with Bev Boss, and my relationship to her is I am a student of hers, a friend of hers, and I am now a parent of a child that is at her school. My name is Bev Boss, and I'm 80 years old. And I am, it's October 2nd, 2015. <laughs> How did it happen so fast? And we're in Sacramento, California. My relationship to Justin is I was his first teacher, as I was to his brothers and sisters and a good friend of his mom and dad's. All right. So just for a little bit of background for someone who doesn't know Bev, I'm going to read a short introduction. For 50 years, Bev has been a relentless advocate for learning through experience, particularly play, maintaining a steadfast belief that when it comes to children, if it has not been in their hand and their heart, it cannot be in their brain. Bev, along with her collaborator and son-in-law, Michael Lehman, have led over 6,000 seminars and workshops in every state and various countries throughout the globe. This year marks her 50th anniversary of her work with the Roseville Community Preschool, a place of wonder, discovery, and experience. So, Bev, my first question is, how did you get involved in teaching? Is it something you had known you'd always wanted to do? Well, I always thought, even as a young child, that I wanted to be a teacher. And my mom used to say, oh, no, 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 you don't have any patience at all. And I think that's what's made me a really good teacher. No patience with people who don't do what I tell them to do <laughs> and take care of children the way I want them to be cared for. And... Um, after I had was married and had five children, a good friend who was a nurse um, saw me with kids, saw me, I think it was at a park at first, and she said, I have a son that I've had very huge difficulties finding somebody to care for him. Would you be interested? I said, sure. And he was a handful. But she came over one day after I'd been taking care of him for a long time, and she walked in. I said, come on in, Mary. And there he was. Uh, I was holding him in. He was sound asleep, um, just taking a nap on my lap. And she said he'd never done that before, not even with she and her husband. So then she said, they need a teacher at the Roseville. It was a, called the Roseville Nursery School then. And I want you to apply. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't think I can do that. I have five children. She said, you have to. You have to. And you know, Justin, when some people say, oh, you were born to do that, it's natural. It isn't. I've worked really, really hard because that isn't really how I was raised. So I've worked really, really hard to uh, find out how kids yeah. need to be and who they need to have with them. So tell me a little bit about the, uh, what you saw when you visited for the first time. It, at the school? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I walked in, and I've never seen such a horrible place in my whole life. It was just dingy, and it was I think it was crusty. Did you know that kind of thing? I've never seen anything like it. They had hardly any equipment at all. I went out and looked at the swing, and a couple of kids were swinging, and the back legs of the swing bounced out of the ground. They didn't have it cemented down, and my heart was just pounding, and yet there was something. It, across the street was the farm. You could hear the cows and the, you know, the ducks and the, all sorts of jackrabbits running around, and I thought, this is, this is a good place, and I really didn't... Um, have any dreams about any place else and I thought I could make this place work and once I once I got there I, we've never had any health benefits and no retirement that's why I still work no <laughs> that's not why but um, I've, I've just stayed there because I could be who I needed to be with these kids yeah. wow. um, so you had a family at this time and I know that you've mentioned you also went back to school. So talk about those first couple years, and, and you know you were juggling a lot. So tell us tell us about that. And my husband was a person who worked really late. He had his own business, and so he was always busy. It wasn't easy, but um, I do have a lot of energy, and I I think it comes from passion. I really really wanted to care well for my children. But I also, and this, this sounds funny, but I also wanted, wanted them to have a nice pair of shoes. And so by working, oh, and I want to say this to you. My very first check from the school was $90. 
and it didn't get better for a long, long time. But that was enough to buy five pair of shoes 50 years ago for my kids. So I kind of um, said to them, we can do this, all of us together. I'm going to tell you this sometimes, it was really hard. One time my middle child said to me, she said, sometimes it seems to me that you care more about those kids than you do about us. And that was such, such a hard thing for me. I knew it wasn't true. But you know how you are when you're a child. You mm -hmm. want 150% of your mother's attention. And she was the middle child who really needed it, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I just hung in there. You know, once you get a 90 extra dollars a month, you, you think it's pretty wonderful. And I knew I could do it. Yeah, and so for me as a parent to, to think of this school as that is a very, very hard thing to do. It's one of the most vibrant colorful places I've ever been I'm including Disneyland or anywhere that you can go you know for a young child that place is absolutely remarkable so it is it's always interesting to hear the story about how it all started you yeah. know and it's adding one thing at a time was there <clears throat> I guess you did talk about that a point where you realized that it was going to be your life's work was that pretty early on yeah pretty early on pretty early on I, I was in school I wasn't I wasn't that interested in doing anything at a college level. I didn't want to be with adults. Why, why was that? Well, because I like, I really do like adults in the sense that our, our school is a co-op. Parents have to be there. But to take on um, a college class and teach that, I wasn't, never be interested in that. I like the kids too much. Uh, you know, I noticed that... Um, no matter how tired I am, no matter what's going on in my life, no, and no matter if a kid is sick or something's happened or I've had a fight with my husband, you go there and here's this place. Here's this place where children can be children. And the, the beauty for me of all of it is that no child is expected to be like any other child. So we have 27 children in the morning, 27 in the afternoon, and we don't expect them to all do the same thing at the same time. We would never, somebody asked me not too long ago, they came, a huge group came to visit the school. And one of the things that I think is really hard for little kids is when you expect them to sit in a circle. First of all, the kids way over here are way too far away from you. And that's isn't, they want to be under your feet where they can see everything. And even if they're there, they say, I can't see, you know. But uh, a teacher probably um, kindly said, well, what about circle time? And I said, well, first I want you to tell me how you get them in a circle. How do you do that? That's not natural for kids. They want to sit on your feet. I re I've had kids get their hands underneath my pants and just pull on my leg or pull on my stockings or something or rub my leg, and I think, come on, i got to read this book. But there's that, there's that intimacy, kids doing what they need to do. And, you know, they don't, they don't see it so far away, so you lose them. Of course, I don't mind if they don't pay attention. You know. <laughs> That's okay with me. What were some of the, um, you talked about it just then, but what were some of the first things you remember doing that were different, that were different than other schools? What were, what? Well, the first thing that, that I noticed, and I visited a lot of early childhood programs and kindergartens because I wanted to look at that age, and uh, there are masters out there. But I noticed, the thing I noticed is that all the kids were expected to be in the same place at the same time. And uh, I, I watched and watched and watched, and I watched how unnatural that was. I know that my son, Andrew, when he went to a kindergarten, they were made to take a rest, lay their heads down on the desk. He always went to sleep. That probably wasn't the best idea for him. But, um, and other kids, you know, have so much energy, they're picking up kids under the table. Children aren't at the same place at the same time. So the first thing I made up my mind is that no child would be required to be doing what everybody else is doing. And that the other thing that my other passion, and you know this, Justin, is art. And the art that I saw everywhere, everywhere I went was color by number and everybody painting the same thing. And, every, and they're automatically being, you know, compared. And that's not art color by number stuff and doing things that everybody else is doing and coloring certain colors is absolutely not uh, art. And so uh, very, very soon I just offered paint and all the, you know, we, you know, we must have 250 utensils that kids can paint with and then crayons 
and everybody was so into markers. I remember when markers came out, everybody was jumping around and excited about it. And they're just one of the worst things in the world for kids' hands. They don't help the kids develop their hands. If you ever look at kids, everybody should be looking at kids. They've got a fatty pad on the back of their hand. And one time I went to a workshop, and the teacher called in, the instructor called in four or five little kids. And one of the things he did the whole time he was talking, he was touching the kids' hands. And then when the kids went out, nobody else asked. And I said, uh, I, I want to know why you were always rubbing their hands. He said, until that fatty pad is gone, it's very, very difficult for kids to write. And so they've got to use their hands a lot. And boy, I learned a lot. And a lot of people use Play-Doh. We use real clay, which mm -hmm. is really hard to work with, and you can just see it. We do it for pleasure, but we also do it because that's a good way for that hand to get a little flatter. Of course, I do want to say something. My husband's hand had a fatty pad until the day he died, <laughs> so it doesn't happen for everybody, you know. He also wasn't a very good writer either, yeah. <laughs> you know. But um, so those are the things that I noticed that other people were doing or insisting that everybody come to the, the ga I call it a gathering. People call it the circle time, a gathering. Not everybody has to come, you know. That maybe they don't learn at all in a big group like that. Uh, there's no intimacy in that. I'm really good at it. I'm really good at it. Kids like to come <laughs> because I'm funny. And, uh, and you know, I, I want to tell you something about reading books to kids. When I open a book, I just, I really don't start with words. I say, oh, look at this. And then the kids will start talking. And then I'll say what it says. And then they'll talk some more. K kids, I want, if kids don't say something on the first, first page of a book, I put it down. I absolutely put it down. I just, um, I want to really engage them. I really want them to be thinking about this and, and loving. It's not about me and about how, what a good reader I am, but I want kids to really get into the books and be a good, I think want people to be a good storyteller too because then they get pictures on the walls of their mind. Yeah. I think, you know, something that you've been in the last several minutes been talking about is not forcing not forcing anything on children and I know that art and and is a big you mentioned is a big important thing to you talk about you've said what what isn't art yeah but what is art to young children for you it really is however they want to make their mark no matter what they want to do I'm going to tell you a story and see if you can imagine this I've shown the pictures a lot a little girl said she wanted a piece of paper that covered the whole table and there was two people helping her. So they went in and pulled a big, wide piece of paper, and they kind of taped it. I don't know if they taped it or stapled it onto the table. There was Part of the table was open on both sides. It wasn't a lot, maybe six inches. And I said to them quietly, I said, she said she wanted the whole table covered. And, and I was pretty nice about it, but they kind of ignored me. And she painted on it, but then she stopped and she said, I said it. I wanted the whole table covered. And um, so they, they did it. They got two pieces of paper and added them to it, taped it on the bottom. And she painted and painted and painted. And when she, uh, she got through, she stepped back and looked at it, looked at it. And she got this dreamy kind of faraway look in her face. And I stood back and watched her. And, you know, I had the biggest lump in my throat because I know that probably nobody else would have done that. I mean, it doesn't seem like such a big deal. It's what the kid wants. You know, not too long ago, two little boys who don't paint a lot went over and sat down on the floor and said, we need some red paint. And I said, okay, you want it in a pan or you want it in a, it doesn't matter. So I brought over to them. They started painting with their toes and painted up their legs and then rolled up their pants and got up to their knees. And then they made prints on a piece of paper. And of course, a lot of it was on the floor. Doesn't matter. It's whatever the child wants to do. The brain is always telling kids what they need to do, what they, how they need to use their hands, how they can find out things. And, you know, for all we know, that's the first time they ever counted their toes. You know, I'm painting this toe, this toe, this toe, this toe. And, boy, if I can um, serve them in that way, it's important to me. We can always clean up. You know, the floor is concrete. We painted it a nice bright color. But, you know, and I don't see much of this. I, I have not visited a kindergarten where I see it. And um, homes are not made to do things like that. They should be. They should be. 
but it was just, some of these scenes are so touching to me, and so I know I've done the right thing. Mm -hmm. There are no alphabets. There no. are no letters in your school. No. And there's lots of paint. Yeah. So, so talk about your decision. Why, why do you do that? You know what I think? I guess it isn't so awful to have them up there, but when you put them up there, even though we do a five-hour orientation for our parents, we do a parent meeting once a month that lasts for three or four hours, when you have those ABCs up there, there's always a chance that one parent has forgotten something and think we're going to teach it, and we're not going to. Why do we put that up there? That's not, first of all, that wouldn't be the way you teach the ABCs anyway. I think, actually, you want to know how you should teach the ABCs? A, B, K, D, not A, B, C. But parents see that, and something kind of um, concerns them, I think. It shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think, really, kids shouldn't read till they're se at least seven. You know, one of the things people um, talk about, they talk about kids uh, writing and reading. You know, we do write stories out of their own experience all the time. But one of the things I think, think they talk about uh, reading, and I think, what would they read? They're only three years old. There's, there's not a whole lot that they could read, you know, even if you teach them to read. So they have to have experiences to attach words to, and then it can go to reading. Experience after experience with everything they can. Yeah. So you did talk about this briefly. You run the preschool as a co-op with mandatory parent or grandparent mm -hmm. involvement. That has become less and less common. Why, why do you choose to do it that way, and why do you feel that it's become less? Is it less important, or what is your opinion? Oh, no, I don't think it's less important. It's more important. You know, we, we absolutely, everybody in the family has to kind of be on board for a child. I'll notice something about a child that the parents haven't, or the parents will say, well, you know, Bev, and now we have this community that's concerned about this child. I, I'm going to share a story that um, I hope I can do it. A uh, therapist called me and said, Bev, I've got a little kid who I think would do really well in your school. And I said, okay, if you think so, I know you well. And sure, and uh, we don't have any room right now, but it was all with the end of the year. I said, we'll start in the fall. And she said, you have to come and see her because I, I, you can't, I can't just send her to the... I said, sure you can. I trust you. She said, Bev, come over here. So the next day I went over there, and she had been found in the rubble of a fire and burned beyond recognition. She had no face. She had no hands. Um, it was just overwhelmingly sad. I can't, I can't begin to tell you. I watched her, and I stayed and stayed and stayed. And I, now I knew what she meant, and I said, but she's coming to the school. So I got a picture of her, and during the orientation in the summer, for the next year, I talked about her, and I showed the parents the picture. And so many parents said, I don't think I can do it. I said, what can't you do? I can't hold her okay, you don't have to hold her. She's going to be here. And it was probably one of the most important times of my, of my life because I never let go. And one day, um, the mother who was so adamant that she just couldn't hold the baby, she was a wonderful mother, um, but she just couldn't do it. Uh, she, oh, by the way, her parents gave her up, so she lived with foster parents. So she climbed, the, the mother that didn't really think she could touch her was rocking a couple of other kids, and the little girl ran over and climbed up in the rocking chair on her lap. And she looked at me, and I just kind of shrugged and said, well. <laughs> and it was the beginning. The mother kept reading the story, and I could see the tears streaming down her face. And she said, Bev, that really had to happen for me. But um, she went to Oakmont, I think, you know, and just was a wonderful, I still hear from her now and then. I know her. You know her. I know oh her. She gosh. was a couple of years younger than me. Oh, you know. She ran I, track. With she my ran wife, track. And yeah. she was a very, very, very happy person. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't know that she went to your school, yeah. but she was a very confident person, given her, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, given her physical appearance. Yeah. And she was a wonderful. Yeah, she was a. I believe she was two years younger than me. She was. She was a wonderful person. 
Isn't that amazing? You know, <laughs> I didn't I, know I, that. I saw you, that glimmer in your <laughs> eye when I said that. But, boy, it was... And I'll mm-hmm. never forget one time we were all sitting on the carpet. We were talking about something, and uh, my grandson was... Somebody said... Uh, they were talking about fires or something, and, and he said, yeah, you better be careful, because you know, Selena was burned in a fire, so you'd better be careful with fire. And I thought, oh. And then everybody just chimed in. Oh, the best part... She had a prosthesis so that she could eat and so she could paint and stuff like that. And she hated it more than anything else in the world. And I, I didn't have the courage, I guess, to remove it for her. And so the kids would take it off and they'd bury it in the sand. And then it would be time to eat. And I said, okay, you guys, where are Selena's hands? <laughs> She's got to have something to put the spoon in to eat. Oh, it, it, so I think... Those kinds of things, and we take all kids. We don't ever make an exception, but it taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. Taught me a lot about myself. Taught me a lot about the rest of the world. You know, mm-hmm. and her foster parents were absolutely magnificent. Mm-hmm. Magnificent. You know that big swing we have, where the, all the kids get on, and it's inside, and they're all swinging. The her foster dad used to lay down underneath it, and he'd sit up when the swing went one way and lay down, and the, ki- the kids would go over him and hoot and laugh. It's the only person I've ever had there that did that. I have a question um, about um, the, the school. So you mentioned that um, one of the parents was um, saying that she couldn't hold the child. Yeah. How, how is the curriculum that parents are involved? Was that like a... She's asking what is the level of parent involvement at the mm-hmm. school. They, yeah. they can do everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, the parents in the school can do everything. We trust them. We do an orientation. They know what to do. But certainly if there's um, extenuating circumstances like that, I always pay attention to the parent and to their needs too. And quite frankly, in a case like that, I wouldn't want her to hold the child unless she wanted to. You know, and I don't. With we have seven or eight parents a day, so Selena wouldn't have noticed that. But it's um, it's yeah. it's it's really interesting. Yeah, our parents, we trust our parents. Yeah, it's a real partnership. Which, and it is, and and your level of parental involvement is a lot different than uh, a lot of other statewide educations. Mm-hmm. Which brings me to my next point is that your relationship with the state and the powers of education has always been an interesting one. Um, You once told me that you just stopped listening to people who said no. And so talk a little bit about that and and maybe tell us a story about a time you just said no when they told you you couldn't do something and you did it anyways. Yeah. Uh, And there's some things, some, what you do learn to do is to give up things that are super important. But we have an ecosystem. You know, that pond as you come in the door, that small pond, is an ecosystem. We have plants in there. We have water. We have snails that eat the fish poop. We have wonderful fish. And I want our kids to know about this. I don't preach it, but you can see it. There's no pump on it. It filters itself. It's one of my greatest prides because I, I did a lot of research and I had somebody help us, and the state came out and said, that has to be dumped every day. And I said, this is an ecosystem. Have you ever seen a real pond? And she said, yes. And I said, they don't dump them every day. They're there permanently. And she said, well, then what you'll have to do is she suggested a couple of things. Either I have to put a big fence around it so the kids couldn't get near it. And and I just want to point out that the the pond you're talking about is about the size of a large bathtub yeah, and about knee deep, right? Yeah, about okay. knee deep. It's like yeah. turkey trough. It's just a little yeah. trough, yeah. Yeah, and it's in, inside the school. And she said, um, and I said, no, we're not going to put a fence around it. She said, well, then you have to have a lifeguard. And, well, I, I, I didn't laugh right at her. I just thought, she's following the law because she doesn't understand it. I said, no, I know ponds. We have a pond person that we collaborate with, and we're going to have it here. And um, she was really a damn it that we weren't. So we wrote to the head of the state, and a woman came from Southern California. And I have to tell you, Justin, no matter how cool I seem with things like that, my stomach is just churning because I, I don't want these things for myself. I grew up near a pond. But I want our kids to have these things so they know how to be 
when they grow up, how to, how to save this earth. And um, the woman came in, and she was formidable. She said she was from the state, and I called Michael, my partner, and said, come on over here. The, the woman from the state is here. And in the meantime, she's standing there, and the, the pond is just as you come in the door, you know. And she stood there with her hands on her hips, and she said, this is the pond? <laughs> and you know, I just couldn't believe it, she said. She just shook her head, no, no, you don't need anything. I said, it is an ecosystem. She said, yeah, I know. Can I tell you another story about the pond? Yeah, absolutely. The other thing we have that I think is interesting is we have a cemetery where we bury dead fish and where we bury things that, that die. And, and the kids are really just remarkable at the ceremony. And uh, they just dig a hole, and then uh, I have a song that I sing, and I say, tell me something about the fish. And they say, it was orange. Goodbye, fish, goodbye. Goodbye, fish, goodbye. Tell me something else. I really loved him. Goodbye, fish, goodbye. And so the kids are telling the story about the fish. And one day, I, we buried this fish, and along came a kid with another dead fish. And those fish don't die very often, one every six months, maybe. And so we buried that fish. We got done with that ceremony, and another one came with a fish. And all of a sudden, I said, somebody go watch the pond. The kids are loving the ceremony so much that they're finding dead fish, or they're taking the fish out. Of course, then they're dying. And I thought to myself, do you see, people say you have a cemetery. One day, a college professor said, what gets buried here? I said, dead things. You know, and I, I think that people don't understand. That's, that's all of life's processes. You know, here they are, kids. They see these things grow and die, and you bury them. And it's the way it is for everybody. But I don't know very many preschools. Drive around. See if you find another preschool that has a, a cemetery. And a pond. <laughs> yeah, and a pond. <laughs> and a zip line. And a zip line. <laughs> and a zip line. And things that kids can drag around and change. And Yeah. yeah. Nothing's permanent except the swings, and no, if you start a school today, you can absolutely not put swings up. You know why? Some kid got knocked over by a swing. So, you know, it's, it's always, and I, I have to say, I think it's part of being a first kid in the family, too, is that I probably worry more about the state coming than anybody, because I don't want anybody to interfere with this. But I also know if you don't get state licensed, insurance is really expensive. So I've got to think about the parents and the cost and, the, you know. So I, I worry about those things probably more than any parent. <laughs> yeah. So in the last, I, you probably know better than I. For and I pay attention to these things a lot more now that I'm a parent. But um, at least for the last several years and probably decades, there's been uh, a very uh, public shift and attention given to early childhood schooling and early childhood education. And there's a lot of debate about, you know, what we should be doing with our three and five year olds. So since you've run a school for 50 years, you know, what is your opinion of, of what a school should be focused on at that for the children of that age? Play. The, all the conditions for human growth, everything that talks about how we grow, they're all in play. And a few more people are talking about it these days, but that's what I talk about all the time. Um, belonging. How do you belong? I have to tell you, when I go to places and kids are all sitting in a circle and somebody's doing the ABCs with them, most half of those kids don't belong. Half of those kids don't belong because they're, they're not interested. They're, they're, they can't see it. It doesn't make any sense to them. They need lots and lots of experiences before they ever do that kind of thing. So Ex explain that. Why ex expand on that a little bit more? Because I know. But, but what about th about having more experiences? To yeah. Experiences to attach words to. What do things do? How does that work? You know, knowing that, then you can put words to it. Well, I did this, 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 and this, and this, and this happened. You know, um, I, I took uh, one day. A little boy made out of clay. I think you've seen the picture where he made kind of a tunnel and a hole. And he had he put a poured the water up here and it ran down here. It's exactly he doesn't know it, but you know where the um, what's the bypass? The oh, yellow bypass. The yellow bypass. Yeah. That's what happens to the water. You know, you could see it. He he made a place for the water to go. Those are the things kids have to figure out. They have to they have to have this 
feeling about the earth what's important. I dug this hole and this worked and this worked. I had a fight. I had a fight with Justin. But then he got nice and I, I, I'm his friend again. They have to do all, they have to have literally hundreds of experiences to write about and to feel about. You know, um, even when they, sometimes they, they write about, I couldn't ride the trike when I first came here and then I could climb on it. And then I could ride it, and now I can ride the trike. All those things help form this child, and it's going to, it's, it's going to carry them to the end of their days. And I know it. <laughs> Look at you. So there is a, I might, I might quote it wrong, That's all right. but there is a painting in the back of the preschool that wraps around, a, a, I'm going to call it a racetrack. It's a planner, but it's a racetrack for, yeah. for the kids and the boys, and it says, I believe it says no sensible child would walk when they could run. Yes, like that. Walking is slower and not much fun. Sensible children always run. And I see so many places where it says no running. <laughs> Kids have to run. Kids have to run. And one of the things I want to say if we have time, I think what's happened to kids is they've gone public too soon. You know, when I was a kid, my mother and dad never took us out any place. We played at home. And we did the things that we could do. And uh, I think I think it's really hard for kids today. I think the mall is really hard for kids. I think uh, I think even restaurants are hard for kids. You know. Another, I'm going to shift talk topics a little bit, but I want to talk to you about your. And I don't know what you call Michael, but he he is you, the two of you are now are now one with, yeah. with the school. And uh, Michael Lehman is your son-in-law? He's my son-in-law, yeah. Okay, so talk about how, how you met him and how that relationship evolved. Well, I, I didn't think it would evolve like this. I mean, it's just amazing. But it, we were a singing family. We always just sit around in the evening, and we play the guitar and the auto harp, and we sing. And that was a, a big part of our Sundays. And then uh, one, we were recording a, a, a CD. It wasn't a CD. It was... A, tape probably but um and we were he was hurrying home from work and and he 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 said to me I've got to stop this uh, and I thought oh my gosh we've been singing together for a year we're doing concerts and stuff he said I need my other job and I've just got to hope that I can do it because I, this is just it's just madness it's just madness and it's been a long time probably 25 30 years and so he did and we went on the road or you know, we are on the road every weekend and every single week, and lots of times, there were times, Justin, when I would do a workshop in San Jose on Monday night after school, and then I'd go back to San Jose the next night. And I used to say, I was here last night. Why? Well, no, no, we want you to ourselves. And so we were always back and forth. I can't, you just can't imagine. By that time, of course, my kids were, uh, at least all of them were in high school, some of them were out. And of course, mm -hmm. Carrie was married, the oldest one, to Michael. But it's just an amazing, he's the one who probably keeps me grounded because you know how I am. I'll just go off on something and, or want something so badly. And um, the minute I see something that I th think I, is really neat for the kids, some new, not new thing, but new idea, you know, I'm just panicky to, to get it going um, because I think it might be for one kid, it might be really, really good. And uh, he kind of says, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, it'll be okay. We'll get it. <laughs> oh, come on, come on, come on. You know, I, I don't have all that long to live. Maybe. No, you've got, you've, I have another child. Oh, yeah, that's right. I have okay. another child, so you have, I have she's to do only one. So yeah, so I <laughs> we need you around a while longer. Um, something that I am particularly interested in uh, is the role of fathers. How have you seen the role of fathers changed over the years? I'm going to tell this embarrassing thing. We have a manual that we put all the things we want you to know, not everything, but a lot, and the bylaws of the school. And for the first maybe 10 years, it said mother's manual on the front. And one of the things that I'm really ashamed of now, you know, but the mothers were the only ones that were involved. And, and yet I thought, oh my gosh, I did a dad's breakfast. All the dads came for breakfast with their children and stuff, and so I tried to include them, and they always came for work day. But now we sometimes, some days we have more dads than, more, than moms in the preschool helping, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful thing. They're different. Men and women are different. Men bring things to the school that uh, women wouldn't even try. 
you know. So, and and mothers are uh, mothers like to rock the kids. You know, dads do too, but that's not their. I had a dad one time. He probably weighed two seventy five, maybe three hundred, and he spent the whole day wrestling with the kids. He just laid down, and they would just climb on him, and he would say, "No, no socking." No, 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 no doing this, no doing that. But he was wonderful. He was wonderful. And the kids used to say, where's that big guy? Where's that big guy? He needs to be here. <laughs> so dads have, uh, one night at a parent meeting, I don't know if you were there, but I, I, before we started, I said to Michael, I, wait a minute, I want to stop a minute. Look around, everybody. There's more men here tonight than there are women. And this is magnificent. Of course, I like men a lot, you know, so that it's, Michael says, well, I don't know. <laughs> Might be better the other way. But um, I, I think the difference between men and women, women can chatter a lot about wanting to do something. Men will listen, but they'll do it. They don't, they don't talk a lot about it. You know, they'll, they'll just, you'll hear them up on the roof when we have a work day. You hear them, the dad up on the roof hammering this. Not that women don't do that, but there, is, there are differences between men and women. And I like men, so it really works out well. <laughs> We're getting near the end here, so I have oh. a I have a question. Are there are there any regrets? Are there is there anything that sticks out in your mind that you would, you know, you would have changed or, or that you wish you would have done that you didn't? Well, maybe in the very beginning, um, before I really figured it out, but it wasn't very long. But uh, the one thing I wonder is if I've done enough for every family. You know, has any family ever had questions that they thought they couldn't, I couldn't answer? Or, um, and then, of course, I worry, too, about my, my own family. I've worked hard. I've worked incredibly hard. And, you know, when uh, my husband was sick and dying, I just um, I did the very, very best that I could. Uh, but you, don't, you still can't, you can't spend every day at home. We took really good care of him, but there are there are some of those things that I anguish about. Not much. There's times when I've maybe been a little tougher than I had to be. Like I know I've done workshops, and somebody who said, "Well, Bev, maybe," and I say, "No, that's not okay. You, uh, we're not going to. We don't do that in our school, you know." And I'm talking to uh, people in a workshop, and I know. Well, I explain that a little bit more. What do you mean we, do, well, we don't? Well, well. Like, they'll have an idea, well, we do such and such. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Oh, like for Halloween, we do uh, very specific things for Halloween that other people will tell me. But they're not developmentally appropriate. They're not what kids can do. Parents have to do most of it. Uh, in fact, I just wrote a letter for all the parents in the school. We have to look at kids developmentally. Kids, are, kids think when you put a mask on, it's, you're not there anymore, many of them. They don't know how to say that. All they can do is cry. So we don't allow masks in the school. And I hang really tough with that. And um, sometimes I think maybe I've been uh, harder on parents than I, than I should have been. But I don't, I, I don't torture myself much about it. I've already done it. But I am, for me, the child is of utmost importance. You know, you've had your chance. The parents have had their chance to do, to be a kid. And I'll fight for childhood as, to my last breath. I want something on my tombstone, though, that re reflects that. That, you know, she never gave a prime for the kids. She never, no, she protected childhood yeah. till, the, till the last breath. Absolutely. Well, I think we are we are approaching our, our time limit here. So uh, from myself, but also from all of the parents that I know, um, and I know a lot of parents, I know a lot of kids that have gone to your school over the years, including not only my brothers and sisters, but my cousins. Yeah. My aunt taught, taught briefly for your school, and uh, all the parents that we've met and everything, we, we do thank you and Michael for everything that you've done. It's um, Roseville is not a place that has a lot of unique places to it. It is kind of a suburb of, the, of Sacramento that is a wonderful place to raise a family, but is not well known for a lot of individuality, and your school is probably the most unique and individual thing uh, there that I'm so proud to say that, that it is home to Roseville School. I'm proud to say I grew up in Roseville and we have Bev Boss's preschool. That's amazing. I just, what an amazing um, time here. You know, not very many parents have said that. They, they say, you know, we love you. and They talk to me, but um, nobody's put it 
as wonderfully as there you is have no, to. There is no other school out there like yours, and, mm. and I was blessed to go there, but I'm, I'm much more happy that my... That it's still going, and that my children are there. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I, we we love every day there. Yeah, and I love having you. <laughs>